ओं सर्वे सुखि सर्वे सन्त निरामय सर्वे भद्रा पश्य माँ कशि दुखपाभवे लोका समस्ता सुखिनो ओम शांति शांति देर इज सम कैंड ऑफ केरला समाज ऑलसो इनवॉल्व आ दे एनी मेम्बर्स यर जस्ट ओ गुड प्रज्यूडिस एनीवे सो द टॉपिक दैट आई एम सपोज टू डील विथ टुडे साउंड स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड बट एज अ लिटिल डीप अफेयर बिकॉज द सब्जेक्ट गिवन इज um vedanta for the modern world deeper aspect of it okay so first let's describe look into the word vedanta and then the modern world and put two and two together <coughs> i think that's the way to go about it. <coughs> the first vedanta we all heard about vedanta in fact uh, uh in kerala sometimes when we talk too much and advise people they say hey don't talk so much vedanta let's do something so it's a popular word it's common word but i don't know how many people realize the deep meaning of what it actually conveys so let me start from the beginning with the word analyze the word first veda anta so we know what the vedas are of course you know all the vedas you you may not know all the vedas you know what the vedas are so we have the rigveda yajurveda samaveda and atharvana veda these are main divisions of the veda it was actually all mixed up it was veda vyas you know the very word vyasa in sanskrit means a compiler is called veda vyasa because he compiled the vedas split them into four parts rig yajur sama and atharvana of course not written down for many years vedas were learned by rote nobody wrote down and read because they were learned by rote they were known as shruti because you listen to them you didn't read the vedas you listen to you can't write shruti you can only hear shruti right so these are the vedas now somewhere along the line <coughs> there is a misunderstanding that when you say veda it's only the samhita portions no for clarifying when you say veda it means samhita brahmana aranyaka and upanishad these are the four sections just the samhita doesn't mean veda the veda includes this whole thing from samhita to brahmana to aranya aranyaka and upanishad so when you start with the samhita portion now even the samhita portions of the vedas have something which are known as the mahavakyas the great utterances the mahavakyas are interpreted by the rishis the essence of the mahavakyas ultimately are interpreted in the upanishads then the upanishads therefore form the last part of this body of literature which is the vedas and each veda has its own set of upanishads so since the upanishads go to the depths of understanding of what the mahavakyas mean like prajnanam brahma tatvamasi and so on i'm a little worried about saying aham brahmasmi and so on uh, <laughs> in the wrong way it might just build up your ego that's all so uh, so these mahavakyas are explained and we make to understand what they really mean basically by the upanishads 
and these Upanishads form the last part of the Vedas, Vedic literature. Now, the last is called in Sanskrit Anta. So, when you say Vedanta, basically it means the teachings of the Upanishads, Veda Anta. It also has another meaning which is that which when one studied, nothing more needs to be understood. Veda also means study, Anta means end, so there is nothing more to be, it is done, finished. So therefore also it is called Vedanta. Now, we will look into each carefully. Veda, Vedanta, when somebody goes to study Vedanta traditionally, there is a curriculum. And the curriculum is called the Prasthanatraya. Prasthanatraya means three important parts of the curriculum. First, of course, are the Upanishads. Then, you have the Brahma Sutras, which are so abstract. Can you imagine a, a text starting with Atato Brahma Jinyasa? Let's study about the Brahman. I mean, <laughs> so wait a minute now. What is this Brahman we are talking about? So it's very abstract. So, but it also forms part of the prasthanatraya, the three curricula necessary. So, one Upanishad, second the Brahma Sutra and third of course is the Bhagavad Gita. So, like I am not going to go into that, but like I said yesterday, Bhagavad Gita simplifies Vedanta. Like it is difficult to get an understanding through like Brahma Sutra for instance. Upanishad, yeah to a great extent, but Gita kind of makes the teachings of the of Vedanta simple and practical and applicable to daily life. However, these three are the curriculum. So now we'll start one by one and go from the Upanishad side first. The many Upanishads. Out of the many Upanishads there are eleven major Upanishads. 11 major Upanishads because all the great Acharyas have written commentaries on it. This is something great about the Hindu or the, the ancient system of thought which developed on the banks of the Sindhu river and that is that there is nothing excluded. It is also inclusive. 2000 years ago, the Rig Veda said, Ekam Sattva Prabhauda Vedanti. There is only one truth, but the wise men may call it by different names. It's not as if I have only one book, I have only one, I won't look this way that we know. There are different, it's like a huge ocean into which different streams flow in. The thing is, when the streams flow in, they are lost in the ocean, you don't see them separately. So, this is, so, while there are so many Upanishads, the eleven major Upanishads are those on which the important Acharyas have commented. Why I am saying this is because there is the interpretation and commentaries, karikas by Adi Shankar Acharya. I am not mentioning him first because he was from Kerala, but <laughs> <laughs> Adi Shankara, even the Gita and the Upanishads, perhaps the first commentaries that we hear of, we know of, are by Adi Shankara. Perhaps there were other commentaries because he sometimes says that it is not been properly interpreted by somebody and so on. Before that, of course, there was his Guru's Guru Gaudapada Acharya, who also did a lot of work on the Upanishads, especially the Mandukya. And the fact is, if you take up one Upanishad, we might have to have four satsangs. I am trying to make it as short and as possible for us here. You can go home and start the study mm -hmm. in detail. 
So why I said this is because when Shankara interprets the Upanishad or the Gita, he has his Advaitic interpretation because he believes Advaita Vedanta, which says Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, this world is is an illusion and the Brahman alone is real. Now, we have to be very careful with this. While in the ultimate analysis it may be so, we have to be. Now, then came Ramanuja Acharya. You know, when Vedantic teachings of Advaita Vedanta became too cerebral and people kind of lost the heart, and became too caught up in intellectual discussions and started saying the world is an illusion when you have to eat, drink and sleep and so on. Ramanujacharya, what happens is when these things change then somebody appears on the scene. So came the great Ramanuja. He agreed that there is uh, Advaita, there is only one reality. That when Nimbarka also says there is Shuddha Advaita, one reality, but only Krishna. Mm -hmm. Advaita simply means one. <laughs> so when Ramanuja Acharya came, he wanted, he found that the devotional element was missing a little bit. So he introduced little more of Bhakti. It's not that Shankara didn't know about Bhakti. I think he was also a great Bhakta, actually after doing all the study of Vedanta, written so many commentaries on the Upanishads and saying this, there is only one reality and then nothing else exists. Having said that, he was also the author of Bhaja Govindam, Bhaja Govindam, Govindam Bhaja Mudamate, which means, O oh fool, Muda is a fool, fool, sing the name of Govinda. Samprapte sannihite kale nahi nahi rakshati dukhrana karane which means your time is approaching when you are going to go. Samprapte sannihite kale, it is time. Grammatic constructions are not going to help you. Nahi nahi rakshati dukhrana karane bhaja govindam bhaja govindam govindam bhaja sing the name of govindam. So, it is not that Shankara. In fact, among the best tantric books that we have today is the Saundari Lahiri. Who is the author? Adi Shankara. But what happens is the followers who come after, they are the ones who twist and make things different. So, Ramanujam found this was happening. So, he came and introduced, which is also Advaita, that there is only one reality. He said, why don't we call that reality Narayana instead of Brahman, Srimad <coughs> Narayan. And he said, is it Vishishta Advaita. Since we are on Vedanta, I am just trying to give you a, because otherwise there is this big fight between we are, you know, Ramanujites and Shankarais. It's a different ways of looking at things. So, Ramanujan Acharya introduced what is known as Vishishta Advaita. In fact, all the priests you will find in all the ba the Balaji temples, Tirupati te temples, they are all belonging, Sri Vaishnavas belonging to the Ramanuja Sampradaya. They believe a lot in rituals. For them to think of God is to think of God as living. So, in Tirupati if you go, they put God to sleep. In the morning they put Him in the uh, uh, what is that called? Swing. Uh, and everything is done as if there is somebody living. So, Ramanuja introduced Vishishta Advaita because he said the heart connection is required, just can't intellectualize. So, he said, true that every human being is part of the divine, okay, I agree with that, but his theory was that if there is somebody, something called Sri Narayan, a figure, let's say. Now the body has many cells, right? All Jivatmas are the cells there. You can't say the cell is not important, but you cannot say that it is the supreme because it's a collection of cells there. But the supreme cell is here, handling everything, that is Narayana. While you are enjoying the benefits of that. 
we also said while it's true that everything is made of one substance which is the reality the brahman said water is water in the sea water in the river water in the pond even this glass which is filled with water is also water nobody is denying that but in this water you cannot run a ship you can do it in the ocean that is narayana and this is jiva i mean these are people who study things and went deep into it and talked with experience anubhav is so important otherwise we are caught up in theories after him ke i am talking about vedanta which is why i am saying this unfortunately you know people say vedanta means there are some people who say it must be advaita vedanta it can't be anything else not true even the vaishnavas chaitanya mahaprabhu's people also have a vedanta bhakti vedanta so when then came ram uh, madhvacharya you know the udupi temple krishna temple in udupi is run by the mathas belonging to madhva any painting of madhva nobody had pictures of course photographs any paintings of madhva you'll see him sitting like this that means there are two not one <laughs> which means what we said the jiva is jiva the brahman is brahman if the jiva being finite has some qualities of the supreme but since the jiva is finite it cannot merge in the infinite if the if the finite merges in the infinite then the infinite becomes a conglomeration of finites <laughs> is not possible he said when the jiva becomes pure when the mind becomes pure and the jiva shines forth it reflects the glory of the supreme that's about all i can talk about padwa said not it is he didn't say it's the same he didn't say it can merge he said when it is purified then the reflection of the divine falls on it this is the highest state one can attain i say that we can start somewhere at least there <laughs> let's not <laughs> so these are the different approaches to vedanta and after that so as i said vedanta is the last part of the vedas which are basically the upanishads the gita now why i am saying this is very interesting but uh, 12 years ago i was invited to harvard where there is a very big department of philosophy and religion so there was a quite a good audience and the front rows usually were professors uh, of uh, religion psychology philosophy some indian philosophy uh, all are whites not an indian so when i in my talk kept referring to vedanta vedanta one of them stood up and said sir when you say vedanta which vedanta are you talking about advaita vedanta <laughs> or vishta advaita or dvaita of madhva which vedanta are you talking about so then i could explain to him what i'm saying is in an indian audience nobody has asked me this question why why are we not studying our own texts why don't we look at it it takes somebody from there to ask you so anyway so this is vedanta so now the content of vedanta what vedanta says let's start with the upanishad let's not look at shankara or ramanuja or madhva let's look at it directly ourselves these upanishads were taught in the great forest academies varishis intimately to their students not like a lecture like this intimately the student went and stayed with the rishi for many days no sharat is going to say i'm going to come and stay there <laughs> <laughs> they stayed with the teachers and spent time with them and therefore it was intimately given to them and therefore it was called a rahasya because it is a dangerous subject 
a person who has no other background, I always tell them, somebody said, I'm going to read Yoga Vashishta. I said, hold on. First, read other things. <laughs> if you suddenly directly read Yoga Vashishta, you might turn into a um, atheist or something. We need qualification to read that. So, when the teacher found that the student was ready, then he taught intimately, sitting together. So, it was called Rasya. Almost whispered. So, which is why the Upanishad is called an Upanishad. Upa means to go close. You have, people have Upavasa means to, to move towards closeness, not fasting. I mean, fasting may help, but actually Upavasa means to travel towards the reality. So, upa means close, not C-L-O-S, close, but close, to move closer. So, to move, so therefore it was a teaching given one-on-one -on -one by the Rishi and the student who sat close to each other. One. Second, it is that teaching which takes you as close as you possibly can to the reality. Okay. Then, Shad. Upanishad. We'll come to Niya afterwards. We'll connect it. Shad means to sit. Which means what? That sit down and listen to what is being said. Now you're all sitting, so I hope you're all shut. But when you stand up, I know the attention is gone. <laughs> right? So sitting is a sign of listening. Even for eating, it's a good thing to sit. Nowadays, fast food, everybody stands. In. <coughs> sit down. Not good for health. Then, apart from that, shad also means that the mind has sat down. <coughs> you know, physically one can sit here, but the mind can be moving. So, shad means that the mind is also settled, sitting. Now, Adi Shankaracharya, being such an expert in the use of Sanskrit, also found another meaning of shad. He said, shad also means to shake up. Shake up what? Shake one up from the sleep of ignorance. One. Shake one up from the sleep of ignorance. The other is, shake up one's so-called uh, limited uh, rational thought. Rational thought is good, but it is generally quite limited. If you can shake it up a bit and say, maybe this is not the right way to look. Well, a linear thinking is good when something is there and you are reaching up. What happens to something which is everywhere? How do you do that? How do you, how do you go? If, if it is there and I want to go there, I go. That's one way of looking. Very logical. What if there is something which is here, there and everywhere, how do I go? Which is what? Shake up your ordinary mode of thought. Things are turned upside down. There is a beautiful 15th chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, which is called Purushottama Yoga, Yoga of the Supreme Self. Beautiful illustration. Kind of makes you understand what is shaking up and putting things down on the head, upside down. Ordinary modes of logic are reversed. And that, you can call it fuzzy logic, if you like. And this is a beautiful chapter, which is Urdhamulam Matashyakam Ashvattham Pravravyam Chandam Siyasya Paranani Yastam Vedasad. You sing it, it sounds better. Uh, <clears throat> which means, there is an upside down Ashvatha tree, people tree, whose branches are up above, I'm sorry, whose roots are up above and branches down below. This is the reverse of any other tree, people tree that we know of, where the roots are down and the branches are up. Here the roots are up and the branches are down. 
It's an illustration of turning a thing on its head and saying this is not the logic that we are looking for. We are going beyond ordinary thinking, beyond the thought process created by our five senses. So shad also means shake up, wake up. There may be other modes of knowledge than what we think. At least you can suspend your judgment, perhaps. That much we can do. Of course, to understand this needs a sharp uh, intelligence. Otherwise, why would you chant the, the Gayatri? Uh, what is the last sentence of the Gayatri? Yo yo na prachodayat, may by intelligence be awakened or stimulated. So, it's important to have an intelligence. But the most intelligent person very soon discovers the limitations of the intellect. This is the Upanishad. Can you Upanishad? Starts by asking the question, who are you? So this who, I, who am I identity crisis has been there for thousands of years. <laughs> Even people have a fight, they say, who do you think you are? <laughs> There is a Peter Sellers movie in the olden days where somebody asked Peter Sellers, who do you think you are? He says, in India we don't think who we are, we know who we are. <laughs> 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 so, Keno Upanishad is from the Samaveda. It starts by asking the question, Kene Shitam Patati Prashitam Manaha, Kena Prana Prathama Prayati Yukta. Kene shitam vacham vimam vadanti chakshut chotram gaude yulati, which means who, what is the first impetus that, to prana which created life? Kene shitam patati prasitam mana. What is the first impetus of thought that came in? Kena prana prathama prayati yukta. What is the starting point of this whole energy system? What is it that makes you understand when somebody speaks? Chakshu, Chotram, Kaudeva Yunati. When you say you see, and when you say you hear, who is hearing? A dead body also has eyes and ears and everything, doesn't hear anything. Who is the witness that's saying, ah, yeah, I register? So therefore it's called the Keno Upanishad, Who Upanishad. Can you imagine 2000 years ago, a literature called Who? I mean, sometimes you're amazed. <laughs> I'm just giving you examples of the Upanishad. So, in yogic terminology, this upside down tree is in the human system itself. Because this is the body, right? Where is the control? Everything is controlled from here. Even the movement of the limb. In the same way, in the universal scheme of things, switch is up there, the control. And the rest, what we see are the leaves and the branches. So studying the leaves and the branches, we think we know everything without touching the root. It's only when the root is touched that you know. So, these are some of the teachings of the Upanishad and there are so many Upanishads interpreted by so many great teachers. In fact, I won't go into this is not the place. So, the Upanishad basically teaches you how to move towards that source from which we have come. And the good news, the Upanishad says, that source in the form of a tiny spark is in every living being. You can't, you don't have to run somewhere to find it. Well, I did run because I was, something compelled me to run, but you can find it here. You don't have to run anywhere. That is the good side of it. This is the teaching of the Upanishad. While that supreme reality, the all-pervading reality, is everywhere, only place we can access it is in our hearts. And if you have accessed it, you see it also outside. 
right? So this Upanishad is therefore called Veda Anta, that when understood and experienced, there is no more desire to learn anything or to experience anything because it is the highest happiness and bliss that one experiences. In fact, the Brahman is called, the Supreme Reality is called Anantamanandam Brahma. That Ananda which has no end, Anantam. Anandam Brahma. This is where the Puri, and this is Vedanta. Now, if you look carefully, one would think that when this is understood, a human being retires into the forest and stays there and does nothing wrong. All the great beings who have touched that have felt this irresistible urge to make others understand it. Why? Because why is everybody suffering not knowing this wonderful treasure? When the mind expands, one of the qualities that arises is kindness and wanting to share what you have experienced. You are having lovely wine. What about the other guy? <laughs> So, this is the reason why most people who have touched it have also been incessantly working to spread this message. Not because they want anything or they have, they don't have needs actually. Yeah, you have needs. If you are a physical body, you need to eat and then you need clothes, a place to stay, all that is fine. But beyond that, what is the urge? There is no urge. The urge is a spilling over of the feeling that one has touched something can we share it with others? I'll give you so many examples. Well-known example, not so far away, is Swami Vivekananda. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, his guru, was quietly sitting in the temple in Dakshineshwar as the priest of the temple. And then he left, of course, and he was teaching. One of the people who he taught and who became uh, well known was Swami Vivekananda. There were others. Swami Vivekananda, I will tell you an experience which he had with his Guru which will explain this to you. One day, in deep meditation, Swami Vivekananda, who was then known as Naren, experienced what is called the highest Samadhi, Nirvikal. And then slowly he came back to consciousness, to outward consciousness. Somebody went and told the master, Thakur, Naren has just closed, opened his eyes and he's saying, what is all this rubbish? There is nothing like this. There is only one reality. Thakur said, go bring him here. So he was brought there. Ramakrishna was then not well, he was in bed. He asked to, Narayan, what is your heart's desire? He said to remain in that Nirvikal Samadhi forever in that bliss. He said, scoundrel, <laughs> is this why <laughs> I trained you for so long? You have enjoyed the sweets and you want to keep it for yourself? Hmm? And to just lick it and sit here somewhere far away. There are so many people who are suffering. I thought your mind is expanding and you will say, Oh, I have got the treasure, let me give it to others. And you will say, I want to be always there, do nothing. He said, I never thought you were like this. Please. Some of you are shamed. He said, Thakur, I will do whatever you want me to do. He said, Okay, fine. And he said, Now this, the key, the lock of Nirvikarka Samadhi, I have put and the key is with me. <laughs> I will give it back to you after you finish your work. So what is the work? Go among the people, make them understand that there is such a treasure in this world, in this country, which people don't understand. Plus, do seva to those who are less privileged than you are. He called it the Ridra Narayana Seva. And if you work for those if you serve those who are less privileged than you are, 
That's the meditation that is required in the outside world, modern world, Vedanta for modern world. I think Swamiji blew the first clarion call for introducing Vedanta into the modern world. He said, this is not some obscure belief, it's something which you can touch through constant self-effort. Of course, to have a blessing of a teacher is something, but then you'll also have to put an effort. And then, while you do that, 24 hours you cannot meditate. But Swamiji said, if you can't read the Gita, go play football. Don't sit down lazy in your rooms. In the olden days, all the Ramakrishna missions had gyms. Slowly they're disappearing. So, when this is understood, it is also understood that it is the same Antaryami who is in all, all human beings. And therefore, when you serve somebody, it's worship. So there are so many moving, talking, walking temples of God. What seva can you do? Those who are suffering, give them something, help them to come out of it. And then tell them also, ultimately to get free of the suffering is to find the truth. But you also need temporary relief, right? If you have a headache and you meditate, you need an analgesic. So, when this truth is understood, and the Gita is the one that actually sets its forth in action, Arjuna thinks that to be in Samadhi is like, I don't want to do anything. Krishna says to him, this is not a spiritual feeling, you are lazy and you are afraid that you might lose the battle. <laughs> this is what is making you do. Don't think you are thinking some high thoughts. Take up your bow, do your work. And then, then the 18 chapters of the Gita teach you how while you work, you can touch the core. Or while touching the core, you can do work for the benefit of others, not for yourself. So all the great Vedantins who had had the Vedantic experience, they have all tried to do what best they can to others. Meanwhile, not letting people forget that one has to go within ultimately for the last solution. This is applying Vedanta to the modern world. And I think it can be done in any part of the world. There's if the Supreme Being is all-pervading, is He not there in Australia? <laughs> or only in one part of the country? And the ancient Vedic prayer one should remember, Loka, Samasta, Sukhino, Bhavantu, may the whole world be happy. Who has said this before? <laughs> Nobody. So what I am saying is, there are these valuable, wonderful teachings of Vedanta which have come to us from in land, from where we come from, ancient land. And it doesn't mean or apply to anybody only in a particular geographical locality. It applies to humanity as a whole. Therefore, understanding this, if we live in this world, while we try to find the inner reality in us, Seeing the inner reality in others, we also serve them to the best of our capacity. Suppose there is a spark of the Divine in me. Suppose. It can't be only in me. It has to be in everybody. Whether that person understands or recognizes it or not, that is not my problem, right? If I know it, it is there. So what do I do? I do seva to that Antaryami who is sitting in every heart. In fact, when people come sometimes and do pranams, I feel like doing pranams back, but then people get worried. Kya ho like? <laughs> and here I am sitting before you. You don't have, because you want to go deep into Vedanta, you don't have to either shave your heads, this is just fashion. <laughs> Shave your heads or change your clothes or 
become our dutas, digambaras, not required. You can wearing your ordinary clothes, wearing, doing to work in the office, doing all, keep one part of your mind on the inner. Say, while I do this, two things. If you want to apply Vedanta to daily life, three important points. One is, realize every morning when you wake up that there is a spark of the Divine in me and therefore it must be known. Right? And two, having understood this, keep at least 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the morning before the day starts where you can sit down quietly, close your eyes and do some mantra chanting or direct yourself inside your heart. We have been given the Gayatri, the Rig Veda. There is no mantra other than the Gayatri. Some people come to me, you know, and they say, um, Sir, uh, I want to learn some mantra from you. I said, okay, what's your name? Shankara Narayana. I said, at what age were you given the Gayatri? Huh? Uh, this age, okay. And are you chanting it? No. Then why are you asking me for a mantra? <laughs> so, we have it. We need to use it. So, to do that, have a little time for your spiritual. Don't say this is the time to take the dog for a walk. I also take my dog for a walk. If not here. <laughs> so, two, one, recognize the divinity. Second, so fix some time for some kind of a spiritual practice. Learn it from them. Or if nothing, chant Gayatri. Three, reflect this in your daily practice, in your life. Go to work. Don't think laziness is Samadhi. Sometimes there is this problem, you know. According to Sankhya, there are three gunas. Sattva, Rajas and Tamaguna. Tamoguna is inertia, laziness, inactivity. Sattva is tranquility from purity. Not the same. And there is the rajas in between, which is activity. So for most people who subside into Tamoguna and think they are very spiritual, I mean Sattva. The best thing is to indulge in some rajas prep your mind up, do some work and then raise it to devotional practice which is also work and then you come to sattva and then you don't have to do anything if you don't want to. But I have seen that most people who are in sattva guna whose mind is tranquil sometimes put in more work than the ordinary person because they don't get tired. Look at Swami Vivekananda. Hundred years a thousand people couldn't have done the work which this man did in a short span of 39 years of life. How? Because then you touch the source of all energy. And the energy is used not for yourself but for others. Then it expands. Then you're all one. And that all one remains even when you're alone. I believe that the word alone comes from all one. So, then what happens? Your life is fine. The world becomes heaven. And others' lives are also influenced by it. So we started with Upanishad and now we are into life. Should I say anything more than this at the moment? So, it's, we started at 4, it's 5 o'clock, one hour. We started at 4 to 4. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can, that is the truth anyway. So, um, we can have some question answers now for a while. Session. And uh, let me stop with Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Hari Om Tachi.
<coughs> I'm sorry, I saw uh, a monk of some order come in late. I'm so sorry, we had just started off. Apologies. So, which order are you from? Oh, I have met uh, your founder when I was very young in college. Uh, Pratap Ranjan Sarkar, Anandamurti ji. Uh, uh, thank you. So, as Guruji has said, we will start the questions uh, from the audience now. I have Sachin on my right hand side and Pradeep on my left hand side who can take questions. If you have, please raise your hands and then Guruji can answer your questions. Thank and you. Have, uh, also, Please give me the right to not answer questions which I do. Sorry to ask a irrelevant question. Ah, then that is better <laughs> not asked. <laughs> anyway. But you have walked all across India, right? Sir. So during that time, what did you feel like, you know, we all were told unity and diversity and all that stuff. Did you really feel anything uniting India when you really walked from Kanyakumari when they spoke different language to Kashmir when they spoke different language and cultures and everything? Well, this is not a purely uh, question based on today's subject, but I think he is sincere about his question. So, let's discuss it a bit. Uh, you know something? India is a unique country. Well, I like all countries, but India is unique. Why? First of all, from the philosophical point of view, 2000 years ago, the Rishi said, Ekam Sat Vipra Bhaudagadanti. There is one truth, but the wise call it by different names. This is early times. Okay. Present times? There are over 30 languages and about that many dialects in this country, in India, right? In general, there is an ID which says, well, I am an Indian. It is unique. You know, in a country where there is only one language, it's much easy to unite people, because there is one language to unite. Here, there are over 25 languages, and how many states? Almost 30 states, you know? And yet, Nobody says I am not an Indian. An Indian. So this, this this unity in variety is very special in India. So when we walked across from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, this is something that we noticed. Somebody may be, uh, I have seen small pockets in some parts of Maharashtra for instance. There are other parts also where the entire population is Hindu or they are born Hindu. There are four Muslim families living there and they have a tomb of an ancestor there. Who looks after the ancestor's tomb? The Hindus. Because these little five families have gone to some other type of Islam where there is no interest in tombs. Who looks after the tombs and worships them? The Hindu population, the majority. So I asked these five families, do you have any problem? We have no problem. We are well looked after. Why? Because we also speak Marathi. We are the same. <laughs> so, while there are occasional disturbances and problems, we can't deny that. You can't pull the rug, put in everything under the rug. But in general, the Indian mind wants to live in unity. This is what I have seen. We walked for one year and four months. Okay. 7,500 kilometers to the length and breadth of India. There is not a single place where I was welcomed. Where I was not welcomed. <laughs> there was not a single place where I was not welcomed. And we went to Gurudwaras, we went to mosques, we went to temples, of course. Even in temples normally where people don't, even a, Pers a, a Parsi temple opened its doors for us. They don't allow anybody to go inside. So, 
the Indian general, in general, there is already a seed of unity. And they all like to think they are Indian in some way. If somebody doesn't, it is our responsibility to make them understand and bring them back. There might be cases, stray cases. I am not denying it, there may be. But more than what we could teach them, the great thing for us is that we had valuable lessons to learn from them. We tried to plant the seeds of unity. But first, we are human beings. Two, we are living in a nation which is like an ocean which welcomes all streams into it. Don't forget this. And therefore, be proud of it. There is nothing wrong in being proud of your beginnings. Donkeys don't have any pride. So, so while we met our value, but we planted these seeds. Now, when we have planted these seeds, you know, when you plant a seed, it doesn't grow overnight into a tree. It takes time. Right climate, proper soil, looking after, occasional ploughing. Right? So, if this happens, I am sure that something wonderful may come out of it. If it doesn't, we have to walk again. What can you do? I just wanted to talk about uh, the lack of Vedantic teachings that you explained that you know, some of the foreign countries probably are more exposed to or probably read more about it. But when we went through school, I think nobody actually even mentioned the word Vedanta. And it's only afterwards that we were exposed to it. So is something being changed now to inculcate that in our curriculum or in the Where? schools? Where? Here or there? Maybe in India. Um, to enrich us of our own culture so that, you know, what we, are, what we are trying to learn now at this age, that could come through at a younger age across the whole population. I mean, when you went across the whole, you know, India. You know, I think that there are some attempts being made, but that is not enough. I would suggest that a subject like Vedanta or even scripture teachings like the Gita and Upanishad should be introduced at least the students in the smaller classes should be exposed to it. And if they have to be exposed to it, it should be considered non-denomination. You know? We shouldn't have, we didn't, needn't associate it with any religion. These are universal teaching. There is, it's nothing. It so happens that what we call the Hindu dharma, the Hindu system of thought, originated from this. So it appears as if it is only associated. It is not. It's a universal teaching. It so happens in those days, the language was Sanskrit. So it's written in Sanskrit. Now, when you say Sanskrit, it does not mean immediately that it becomes a denomination. Kalidasa wrote only plays in Sanskrit. He did not write any religion. Would you not appreciate the drama of Kalidasa? It is an ancient language. So, therefore, two things are required. You should not force it, of course. It should not be compulsory. But wherever students are willing, like in foreign universities, Berlin has two chairs for Sanskrit and both the chairs are chaired by Berliners. <laughs> so, Sanskrit should be introduced, first step. Not forced, I mean, give it optional. Those who want to study Sanskrit as a language, may study in our uh, school, in a small way. We have a boarding school called the People Grow School. It's close to Tirupati in the south. And it's a, called People Grow because uh, please, I am not advertising for the school. It is called People Grow because there are many people trees there. You know, Ashwatha trees. And Grow is one G R O V E, Grow. So, it is an ISC, ICSC school, Delhi board, what was once upon a time senior Cambridge. We have optional Sanskrit. You will be surprised. 88 percent of the kids from class 4 to class 12, opt for Sanskrit. 
Why? Because we have found a way of making them interested. Because we say, don't bring grammar into the picture. Sanskrit grammar is the most complicated. After German grammar, I think it's the most difficult. <laughs> so I said, start with spoken Sanskrit. Very sweet. It's beautiful. And then move. So I personally went and recruited teachers who not only knew grammar but could do spoken Sanskrit. With the result now that you go and see a student. So are you 8th standard? Yes. Are you studying? Uh, are you optional? Have you taken Sanskrit? Yes. What's your name? You'll be surprised. George. <laughs> George has not changed his religion, but is interested in Sanskrit. This is the way it can be done. And then automatically, when you study Sanskrit, the study of Vedanta, everything will come into the picture. I think if the government decides to do this in the curriculum, they should keep it optional. Otherwise, particularly the present government, if they introduce it as a compulsory subject, oh, there will be a big uproar. It is like pushing something down the throat. So, it should be optional. But I keep appealing to the government that please at least introduce it in the curriculum as an optional subject. Let it be optional. It will help a lot. Then we won't have this problem. Later on in your life, even if you abandon it after some time because you want to be a doctor or an engineer, it will be there somewhere. And then when you starts later on you can study. So that if I say Vedanta and say nonsense, you can say this is not Vedanta. <laughs> the problem is we don't know. Sir. We have a question there. Uh, shall we ask the young lady to ask? Okay. Thank you so much for everything that you've spoken about um, so far. Um, there's a lot of literature and people in general who speak about humans being inherently selfish and looking out for themselves. The um, selfish gene. Yeah. <laughs> um, you were talking about seva and selfless service. Um, I was wondering what you felt was the best way to sort of balance those internal needs that you have um, as well as trying to give back and as much as you can. As well. You know, there is no denying the fact that uh, we are selfish. <laughs> Not shellfish, but selfish. Uh, uh, however, the expansion of consciousness in evolution is when we become less selfish. There is the difference between a uh, developed human being and a non-developed human being. A non-developed human being is only like an animal. He wants only for himself food, a sex, have kids, die, go, finished. But there are some who say, no, 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 there may be many serious aspects in life. So this is called evolution. So I think while we need to look after ourselves, we should also try and look after others as much as possible. You can't give an incentive for this. It has to be satisfying to our hearts to do that, so that it has to come from inside. But once you start doing it, you will realize that when you see a smile on a face that was crying for the last two years, something happens to your heart. You want to repeat it again. I have seen this happen. You want to repeat it again. So I am saying, even if you feel selfish in the beginning, go into it and see how other human beings affect your minds, your hearts. And then slowly you will begin to melt. <laughs> you can't help it. I think that's one way of doing it. Especially, and it should start at an young age. You're, you're perfectly all right to start it. <laughs> so please start something. Do some, You don't have to have an organization and go about doing it. You just look after somebody in your neighborhood. It's, it can start like that. All I'm saying is spread out a bit. Don't just be caught in oneself. Open up. Hmm? Yes, sir. 
The divine, I think we should for the time being forget about the divine plan and plan ourselves. Whether there is a divine plan or not, let's not worry about that. Let's see what I can do. Hmm. Yogananda Paramahamsa must have written about it. It may be so, it may not be so, we don't know. Let's leave it at that. Let's say that, can I do something about it? See, what happens is, if I think this is right or this is wrong, maybe there is a divine plan, maybe there is no divine plan, then I refuse to move. I don't do the work. So, leave it, dump that for a while. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, okay? Dump it for a while and see, what can I do as an individual? If this is done, one individual changes, I think the world can change. Just like one Hitler could create so much trouble, one Hitler could make people so armed to the teeth. In the same way, one good person can change it. Now, we should all contribute to it in some way. That's what I think. First of all, thank you very much for wonderful exposition for a simple person like me. <laughs> uh, in beauty, done in such beautiful way that I'm over there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> you put your finger on, on the thing when you said that we need to, in schools, inculcate among students the basic knowledge of what Hinduism teaches, and that's what you are here talking about. Not only here, but sir, I, I go all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> but I go one step further and say we live in a Christian country. Yes. And we are trying to make this into a cultural, religious melting pot. Yes. And to some extent, the Australians are succeeding. Yes. So with that in the background, perhaps should we not, and you, in fact, you have gone through this wonderful path of, uh, you know, Sufism, you know, Hinduism, you know, I'm sure you know Christianity. <laughs> so there are, there are lots of wonderful, deep philosophical themes, friends, within each of these religions. Absolutely. And should they not be combined together for the younger student, mm -hmm. including of course Vedanta and so on, uh -huh. so that for us especially in India yeah. and in India, because yeah. it's the first yes. country, that might be the way to go rather than just concentrate on uh, one particular aspect. I agree with you. In, uh, I understand the question. I don't agree. I understand the question. But I think the, if one goes deep into subjects like Vedanta and study Sanskrit, you might think that would make one a little narrow. It will not. According to me, that will make us wider and make us study other religions. I think so, personally, because you will suddenly realize that, oh, this is so wide, so there must be other branches to it. Now, take Christianity. When did the church come? A oh, hundred years after Jesus Christ. As an organization. Now, look at the personality of Jesus Christ as presented in the Gospels. We don't know anything other than that. He was a quintessential wanderer, whom in India he would have been called a Parivrajak, who himself confesses, saying, the snakes have holes and the foxes have dens. But well, the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. And look at the teachings. Lay treasures in your heart, where thieves do not break in and steal. This is the heart I am talking about. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What are these things? These are universal teachings. But now they have stratified into 
and organization, the religion. So if we can make people understand that here are the core teachings, look towards it. Don't get caught up too much. You know, organizations are required. For from functioning organizations are required. You can't deny it. Now if it was not organized, how would I be sitting here and talking? But then, when the outward structure becomes more important than the inner core, we run into trouble. So while we organize, we should keep that in mind that the inner core is not disturbed. It's, it's not stratified and covered. You know, I, uh, there's a, pop, a story which was told by uh, Krishnamurti about uh, the devil and his friend who went for a walk. The devil and his very close friend went for a walk. Now, the thing is, in India we don't have such a concept of a pure devil and a pure god. It is all mixed up. Some good asuras are there and some terrible devas are there. <laughs> that, that line between black and white, Satan and God is not defined. I mean, there is nothing like that. So anyway, but there it is in the Semitic religions, it's defined. So Satan and his close friend went for a walk. So Satan bent down and picked up something from the grass, from the lawn and put it in his pocket. So his friend asked him, what did you pick up just now? So Satan said, I just picked up the truth, truth, T-R-U-T-H. So his friend said to him, if you picked up the truth, your days are numbered. Because you know, Satan is the opposite of truth. He is untruth, and darkness and everything. So if you have picked up the truth, then your days are numbered, watch out. So the devil smiled and tapped him on his shoulders and said, don't worry friend, I will organize it. <laughs> have to be a little careful on this matter. No, oh, sorry. As a uh, corollary to question that uh, Sanjay asked about, that uh, we at our age may have actually missed the bus in not being able to study the Vedanta in school. And question One minute, can I in, in, intervene? Please don't say your age, I am much older than you. <laughs> You are young. <laughs> okay, doesn't matter. Thank you. <laughs> but if we kind of get, if we are inspired now to seriously turn towards Vedanta and study Vedanta, then I wonder whether there are resources available and uh, uh, where does one look up to and maybe this is something for the participating organizations as well here to kind of make something about whether people can actually reach it. Okay. I, I make a simple statement. Start with studying the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, which are freely available in good English translation in any Ramakrishna Mission bookshop. We can even get it online. I think that is a good start. And then we'll see what happens. I am there, but uh, when you read it and if you have a doubt, then I am sure there are people who can explain it to you or you can explain. Uh, if you catch me sometime, I will try and explain. But uh, Swamiji's works are so neatly and cleanly expressed that I think it is not so difficult to understand. But what I want to say is start somewhere. You don't keep postponing. I mean, I have other things to do. Uh, there's the right <laughs> <laughs> We got one more question here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, on the left. And then that will take the one on the right. Yeah. So just on the right, please keep your microphone switched off to avoid the feedback. Sure. Uh, on Friday, as well as today, you said there is a spark inside everyone. How to get that spark? Is it possible <laughs> in our life? Oh, I just sort of Sir, I think I am so uh, touched by your uh, 
your appeal. I think it can be touched by everyone. I won't say everyone. It can be touched by anyone who sincerely seeks to do it. <clears throat> and the first step would be to theoretically at least accept the fact that there could be. Could be. That's enough. Then if it has to be touched, then you have to go deeper then. So figure out if it's possible to spend 10-15 minutes every day at least fixing your attention on the inner. It means turn your mind within and search. Look inside. See, for that you need to calm the mind. Now to calm the mind there are different methods. I don't know what method would appeal to you. But basically it should be that the mind should be removed from uh, voluntarily removed from all outward distractions, turned within and brought inside. Okay, Then, to, if you want a simple way of looking at it, think that there is a small flame of a lamp burning inside here. Fix your attention on that flame. Chant Om. Hmm? Do it for 5-10 minutes every day, 10 minutes. And then when you begin to enjoy it, you will miss it more than you miss your breakfast. When this happens, then you are on your way. Then you will find out other ways. Somewhere you need to start, right? And please, for that you don't have to change your lifestyle, you don't have to do anything. Because if I say you have to do this, then it's not. Whatever you are doing, it's okay. But start. I think we should stop with this. Uh, it is said that everything is predetermined or already written. Can you comment on that please? I, I don't believe even one percent on that. <laughs> In which case I would not have run away to the Himalayas, worked so hard. If you look at my second book, so many lives I have worked hard. So. Things happen through self-effort. Please keep this in mind. Astrologers will go out of business. I don't know. <laughs> but things happen through self-effort. And these are not my words. These are the words of Vashishta to Rama in the Yoga Vashishta. And Rama says it is all predetermined. Uh, Vyasa in strong words say that people who think everything is predetermined are donkeys. Not you, I'm sorry. <laughs> In the yoga way. So, <clears throat> self-effort is very important. If you see something happening to somebody in this life, which is unexpected, and he didn't do any effort for it, that means in some past life, so much effort has been put into it. So, for the time being, don't think it's destiny. Swamiji, Swami Vivekananda was very upset about this, because he says, this is why India is not moving forward. Because we say it's all our karma. Mm -hmm. You see, the most important part of the karmic theory is what you do now is what you get later. Now, you can't go back to the past and tinker, right? You can't. But present, you have certain circumstances. If you put your attention into it with full attention, a lot of self-effort into it. Of course, grace is required. But only when you put self-effort that the grace comes. Simply, once it doesn't come, so put your, then you will be able to move forward. So he said, this fatalistic philosophy, everything is predetermined. If everything is predetermined, then what is the point? I mean, there is no need of sadhana, there is no need of me sitting here and talking, nothing. Is, you have to put in some self-effort. If you see the situation, try to change it. Don't let it go. It may disturb your mind a bit in the beginning. Because it's very easy to lull the mind into everything is predetermined. So, so sleep. <laughs> so, this is very important. I personally do not <coughs> think that anything is predetermined. Somebody asked me, your master knew what is going to happen to you. So, how did that happen? Wasn't it predetermined? Well, the thing is that there are great yogis who can see what is going to happen. Not because it is predetermined. When they see the present, they know what the result is going to be next in the future. 
But my master was very sure that I had to put in a lot of self-effort. So for many years, he did not discuss the effort that I had put in during my past life. Because he thought then I would become complacent. He started my spiritual practices as if I am doing it for the first time. This is what I think. Hmm? So, bring in some self-effort into this. Uh, especially, when it comes to spiritual matters, people don't like self-effort. Otherwise, uh, for a job, for money, for uh, people work very hard. Nobody says it is my destiny. Uh, when it comes to religion, uh, it will happen sometime. You know, when it's written, uh, they say it's written here. Uh, then some, the, the Shaivites have a beautiful theory. They say when we touch the Vasma and rub it, all that is written is gone and life is new. <laughs> Thank you very much. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shanti.